In No Way Home, Matt Murdock, aka Daredevil, says that he's able to get him to drop the murder charges on Peter Parker because he's a really good lawyer. But, uh, is he? Is he really? One word answer, no. In his Netflix series, he openly misses the opening statements for a murder case because he was busy palling around with Elektra. Oh yeah, and most of his clients wind up dead before their cases hit the courtroom. And all of this is without even mentioning the fact that his, uh, nighttime activities would definitely get him disbarred. So, let me ask this again. Was it plot armor that got got Peter out of those murder charges so easily? Surprisingly, no. There's a reason the murder charges against Peter Parker were dropped so quickly, and it's not what you might expect. And it's certainly not because of Matt Murdock. Sorry, buddy. internet, welcome to Film Theory, the show that could be talking about the multiversal future of Spider-Man, but is instead choosing to talk about the legally fraught past of Spider-Man. It goes without saying, but No Way Home was great. Finally, the MCU's Peter Parker is forced to confront the reality that there are just some problems he can't outrun. Let's be honest, out of all the Spider-Men that we've seen hit the silver screen thus far, Tom Holland's version of Peter Parker has definitely lived the most charmed life. He lives in a huge, gorgeous New York apartment with his young, healthy aunt, and he had a literal billionaire acting as a surrogate father. He doesn't even get bullied by jocks. The version of Flash Thompson that he had to deal with was a fellow nerd from the academic decathlon team. When I say penis, you say Parker! Penis! Parker! Penis! Parker! Oh no, I'm getting harassed by a thin guy in a blazer who's two inches shorter than me. And that's why it's so refreshing at the end of No Way Home to see him having to struggle a little bit in a pristine New York studio apartment that's apparently two buildings away from Rockefeller Center, which if you look at real estate pricing is probably costing him about $4,000 a month. Yep, really, um, really down on your luck there, Spider-Man. Peter, in general, gets off pretty darn easily, and nothing exemplifies this more than the beginning of the movie. Right out of the gate, we're hit with this huge hubbub around Peter Parker not only getting out of the Spider-Man, but also getting arrested by the U.S. Department of Damage Control for the murder of Mysterio. In less than a minute, the interrogator gets Ned to confess and is hidden Aunt May with child endangerment charges. It is electric. Finally, there's gonna be some consequences here, and no amount of web-slinging is gonna be able to get you out of this one. I half expected that we'd be spending the first half of this movie in the courtroom, and then it all vanishes. What was a very public and very serious accusation of terrorism and murder by Quentin Beck, who, it's worth remembering, was a beloved superhero in the eyes of the public, just gets dismissed less than ten minutes into the movie. Matt Murdock, aka Daredevil, just strolls into the room and says, I don't believe the charges are gonna stick, and then they don't. In one line, the entire movie pivots. Next thing you know, Peter Peter's biggest issue is not getting into MIT? Oh, boo Peter Parker, your life is so hard. Not only did he beat the rap, but it seems as if none of them had to go to court. But how? There was a videotaped accusation. There were confessions. There was physical evidence. To make all of that go away seems like quite the tall order, even if you do have the world's greatest lawyer at your side. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. What happened? What would the legal case actually look like here? What would the consequences be? Could the world's greatest lawyer actually beat these charges? so effortlessly? Or should the third installment in the Spider-Man Home Trilogy have been named Spider-Man Home Arrest? Well, what I think I found is that Peter, unbeknownst to him, appears to have been caught in a bigger cover-up. But to understand how and why, let's look through the various charges that the movie presents us with, starting with Aunt May. The lightest of the charges go to Aunt May. The agent says to her, quote, the boy was entrusted to you, and as his legal guardian, essentially his mother, you not only allowed him to endanger himself, but you actually encouraged it. So, would May actually face legal trouble, and if so, what would the consequences look like? Well, when it comes to the law, the first thing that we have to figure out is what laws actually apply. Not all places have the same laws, and they all tend to apply them differently. So we have to figure out who has jurisdiction in this case. In other words, which entity is the one with the right to prosecute? Even though the end of Far From Home took place in London, May's alleged crimes would have been primarily happening in New York. As such, that means we'll be looking into New York's penal law 260.10. <laughs> penal. And after a quick pass through this, yeah, things aren't looking too good off the bat for old May. Guardians could face charges if they act in a way that's going to cause injury to a child or don't provide enough diligence over the child to prevent them from endangering themselves.
themselves, and Peter Parker faces more than his fair share of danger throughout the series. Spider-Man is involved in no less than two wars, Civil and Infinity. This guy is going toe-to-toe -to -toe with aliens and giants. May would absolutely be liable here, provided she had known. You see, the law only applies in situations where the person knowingly acts in a way that's going to put those they care for in danger. This means that May is completely off the hook for the events of Civil War and Homecoming, where she is in the dark for the entirety of both movies. As far as she knew, it was all part of a Stark internship. For Infinity War and Endgame, Peter was definitely put into danger, but not because of the actions of Aunt May. Honestly, the closest she gets is in Spider-Man Far From Home, when we see her encouraging Peter's Spider-Man behavior by making him appear at charity events, and when she packs his suit in his travel luggage. It's her giving consent to him being a vigilante. That said, it would be surprising to see any of this hold up in court. She never actively puts him into dangerous situations. Packing the suit could be seen as an act of trying to keep Peter safe. Giving a speech at a fundraiser? It's probably the safest thing that Peter does in his capacity as Spider-Man. Thank you, Miss Parker, for having me, and thank you, you guys, for having me. Safe, as long as you don't get physical pain from cringing. Tony Stark, on the other hand, would have been totally guilty had those charges been brought against him. In Civil War, we see him knowingly lie to Aunt May. Who else knows? Anybody? Nobody. Not even your unusually attractive aunt? No. He brings a teenager without a passport to Germany. You got a passport? Uh, no, I don't, I don't even have a driver's license. You ever license. been to Germany? And he does all these things with the intent to subdue Captain America, the greatest soldier of all history, as well as his buddy Bucky, the greatest assassin ever, as well as a witch that can juggle freaking cars. Any way you slice it, Tony Stark is guilty as charged. So now let's move on to Ned. Things aren't so rosy for him. He was directly involved in Spider-Man shenanigans, or at least as involved as he can be while sitting in a chair, and he confessed to helping Spider-Man find the Vulture, helping him hack his suit, and quote, kinda helping him get into space. Or, as the DOD agent puts it, in Spider-Man's illegal vigilantism, you were his main accomplice. But hold on here. First off, helping Spider-Man get to space and helping Spider-Man hack his own suit? Yeah, that's, that's not illegal. Secondly, when it comes to that alleged criminal vigilantism that the agent's talking about, it's important to note that being a vigilante in and of itself is not illegal. It's true that many of the things involved with vigilantism often involve breaking the law. For example, breaking and entering criminal hideouts, or committing acts of violence against suspected criminals. But plenty of states, New York included, have citizens arrest laws that allow any person to make arrests if they have immediate knowledge of a crime, or they have reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion that a felony is taking place. In Peter's case, he's not going out to commit acts of unnecessary violence against criminals. In fact, getting the job done while hurting as few people as possible is kind of his whole thing. And as far as we know, the New York police never put out a warrant for Spider-Man's arrest, even after knowing that he was going around the neighborhood apprehending criminals, which strongly suggests that none of what he was doing would be considered criminal. So while the guy interrogating Ned might be using words that sound intimidating, the truth is that unless he has some other actual charge that he's not talking about, Ned probably isn't facing anything that would actually result in criminal penalties. Peter, on the other hand, though, does have a warrant out for his arrest. But what's interesting is that we see him defending himself against a very specific charge. Charge. I didn't kill Quentin Beck. That's worth calling out here because if we look at what Peter was framed for in the previous film, we'd expect him to be facing much more serious charges. He has an army weaponized drone, Stark technology. Are you sure you want to commence the drone attack? There will be significant casualties. Do it! Execute them all. Mysterio not only framed Peter Parker for his own murder, but for the drone attack at Tower Bridge. While we don't see anyone killed on screen, we do see a bunch of people fleeing from the drones as the Queen's Guard battles them. Not to mention the millions of dollars in damage that's being done to Tower Bridge and all the vehicles on it. Those are pretty serious crimes to add to the rap sheet. So is this the conclusive proof? that Spider-Man was responsible for the brutal murder of Mysterio. Based on the evidence presented, would Spider-Man need to go to trial? And once there, would he be found guilty? Well, the answers to those questions are no and no. Matt Murdock is probably right. Those charges won't stick, and you don't need to be a really good lawyer with excellent reflexes to make them go away either. Now, the crimes Peter has to defend against occurred in London, so technically British law enforcement would be in charge, but honestly, we don't even need to get that complicated to see how this case is gonna go. First and foremost, it's pretty clear that Mysterio's video is the only real piece of evidence here for any and all charges. There were no witnesses on the bridge, and as Peter rightly calls out in the movie, he didn't kill Quentin Beck, the drones did. The drones were also the things causing damage to Tower Bridge, so it really comes down to a question of who was in control of the drones. If the drones keep an audio log, well, then Peter is immediately in the clear. Edith, turn off the drones! But we're gonna assume that that's not the case, which means that the video is really the only piece of evidence that we have to go on here. 
here. Right off the bat, it's highly likely that the video would get exposed as doctored. Forensic experts are people responsible for identifying, analyzing, and reconstructing any evidence that's gonna be used in a trial. And they come in all sorts of different varieties. Everything from crime scene analysis, to digital or computer forensics. But here, we'd be looking for video forensics experts. Something that a video forensics expert might do, for instance, is look for inconsistencies in the lighting or shadows. Stuff that a normal viewer might not see, but suggests that the video's been doctored. This is something that's actually becoming more and more important in courtrooms as deep fake videos become better and more prevalent. But with Mysterio's video, this one is actually pretty easy to debunk. They'd be able to immediately tell based on ambient noise that the audio had been edited to pull Edith and Peter lines from two separate moments in time, thereby getting the evidence, and thus the charges, completely thrown out. But okay, let's assume that they can't immediately tell that the video's fake. Is there still a case here? Well, again, no. Look at the video. Peter's face isn't seen on camera. All we see are just some spider legs. That's not conclusive, and likely would not hold up in court. All we have to go off of is Mysterio identifying the individual attacking him as being Peter Parker. Now, this one is actually interesting. Normally, something like this would be dismissed as hearsay, an out-of-court statement that's offered to prove the truth of whatever it asserts. It's Peter because the accuser says it's Peter. That's not evidence, that's just an accusation. But here, Mysterio actually benefits from an interesting loophole. Statements made by someone who's dying are allowed to stay in as evidence. So his accusation of Peter would be kept, but that doesn't necessarily mean hearsay ends here. To get a video like this admitted into evidence, it needs to be authenticated. There needs to be a way to prove that it is what it claims to be. Basically, there needs to be a witness to say, yep, this one's mine, I filmed it. If there's no witness present who can be cross-examined about the evidence, then an attorney can argue that the substance of the photo or video is hearsay, thus getting it dismissed. And considering that the only two people there on the bridge were Mysterio and Peter, the video would never make it to court, meaning that all charges are dropped. In short, for as unbelievable as it was to see the charges go away that quickly in No Way Home, it's not actually that far-fetched. There was nothing truly holding up the case, not even the accusers. And you see, this is the weird little conspiracy that I think I found. So this whole investigation was put on not by the police department or the FBI, but rather by the Department of Damage Control, which, let me just be clear, is not a real thing. It's a fictional organization that exists within the Marvel Universe. Remember when Spider-Man Homecoming started with Adrian Toomes deciding to become the Vulture after his salvage company got put out of business? Well, the reason that the Vulture had to turn to a life of crime was... A joint venture between Stark Industries and the federal government, the Department of Damage Control, will oversee the collection and storage of alien and other exotic materials. A Stark industry joint venture with the government. One that, I might add, started as exotic waste removal, but in no way home allegedly does law enforcement? I don't know, it sounds awfully suspicious. <laughs> And that, I think, is the key to what's really going on here. The way that damage control comes after Peter Parker hard only to completely drop the charges doesn't make much sense if you're just thinking of them as regular law enforcement. But it makes total sense when you realize that they're not law enforcement. They're a cleanup crew from Stark Industries, doing this specifically so Peter, Mr. Tony Stark 2.0, can get off scot-free. By stepping in themselves, they ensure that they're the ones in control of the situation rather than leave things up to traditional law enforcement. Damage control is able to swoop in and make a big to-do about throwing the book at Peter Parker and his friends, putting on a show for the actual police. They make it look like they're playing hardball while actually gently lobbing a bunch of softballs the entire time, making up a bunch of charges that sound scary but actually amount to very little, all while waiting for the anti-Peter sentiments to die down. In the process, they protect the reputations of everyone involved. Oh yeah, and it probably merits mentioning, but in the comics, the Department of Damage Control was actually started as a joint venture between Tony Stark and Wilson Fisk. Yeah, that Wilson Fisk, the Kingpin, who, based on Hawkeye and Matt Murdock's appearance here, is definitely a part of the MCU. Not really saying that it matters here, just pointing out that we should probably be paying attention to who's really pulling the strings the next time we see the DoD pop up. But hey, that's just a theory. A conspiracy theory about the Marvel Cinematic Universe, meaning a film theory. And cut.